<laughs> okay, do we really need to ration? Well, according to Kathleen Sebelius, uh, no. Competition and consumer choice will allow Americans to put together from 5,500 private plans, so that's a huge array of private plans and insurers, their own personal portfolio. And you know that the premiums, deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, vouchers, and so on. What this means is that persons will be betting on their future health, much like, but even less savvy than, traders betting on the stock market. So of course, you say, take your choice of health care plans. Uh, and of course, if you're healthy uh, or expect never to have to deal with it, I'll take the cheapest plan, the highest deductible, etc. If, on the other hand, you're part of the worried well or have chronic illness, give me everything. And that's what you are expected to decide as a non-professional person. This is what I think is just the beginning of what's wrong with, with what's going on. The other said, no, all we have to do is, and that everyone has his or her favorite fix. Fee for service, get rid of it, get malpractice, reduce drug company profits, introduce electronic records, emphasize prevention, coordinate chronic care, pursue evidence-based medicine. All these are being proposed as the solution to the rising intractable healthcare costs. What does Ken uh, Marmer say, and what does Jonathan Oberlander say, and what does the economist say? I'll do an Oberlander. This just came in out of the New York Times. Also, these ideas are wishful thinking. The evidence is either mixed or just not there that these reforms will rein in spending. They are sort of faith-based cost control. Barber says none of these measures is likely to substantially reduce health care spending, even if they improve quality of care and health outcomes. Moreover, and this is important, the illusion of painless savings confuses our national debate on health reform and makes the acceptance of cost controls realities all the more difficult. The Economist, I suspect a lot of you read The Economist or know about it. It's a pretty libertarian, conservative journal. But here's what they say. Every health system rations in some way or other. Demand for health care is always greater than the resources available. The question is whether rationing is done openly and as sensibly as possible or done implicitly through murky pricing, bureaucratic fiat, or denial of care. Will Americans accept ration? I have a budget. <laughs> No, it doesn't fit our culture. No, Dan Callahan, who I will quote later, who was one of the co-founders of the Hastings Center. I don't know how many of you know that's one of the important ethics things in tanks. Americans are urged never to give up hope. Uh, Larry Churchill, individual self-sufficiency, which was a virtue once in American history. It's a big problem now. And then I point out that um, Americans, in, in contrast to Europe, bask in our kind of cheery self-image of rugged individualism. And the cowboy mythology is what has seized this country, even though the cowboy only wandered on the prairies a very short period of time. The mythology has lived for a very long, long time. That's in contrast to Europe, which understands, you know, we're all in this together. They had the concept of solidarity. We are vulnerable. You never know what's going to happen. We have a problem with our culture. It's true. But doesn't irrational rationing already exist? Again, I will go quickly because you folks know this. Yes, the number of uninsured Americans rose to more than 50 million. It's risen more rapidly in the last uh, uh, 10 years than ever before. Here's something that I personally uh, experienced, uh, irrational rationing, uh, and uh, a federal prisoner, an armed robber, a convicted armed robber, uh, went into stage for heart disease. The usual best treatment for that is a heart transplant. This guy got it. And uh, he went on to 60 Minutes. I, I had my 10 minutes of fame. 
and I pointed out that everybody was very angry that this was happening, and, and here's what the, uh, the, the person in charge of the, uh, the court of the uh, prison said. The courts have told us and inmates have a constitutional right to health care. You and I don't, but inmates do. You have to do whatever is medically necessary to save inmates' lives. So he was not alone. There are other convicted felons who've been in the state prison, federal prison, who had kidneys, hearts, etc. Even though hundreds and maybe even thousands of people outside who could benefit even more, sorry, you don't have insurance. That's irrational, I would suggest. Then there are other what I call gated communities, some of which we accept. Okay, military veterans, people over age of 65. Okay, I'll go along with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Patients with end stage renal failure. I'm going to give you some more on that, and I think also you probably know what's going on with federal government workers. They get health care insurance, members of Congress, they get it even though many, many, many people who have to live by the laws that they pass or refuse to pass don't. So that's, again, irrational rationing. So I have already told you I'm going to concentrate on just medical care with, with a kind of long time for the just, what makes it fair and what limits it to medical care. It, and you all, I, I suspect, you know the WHO's utopian uh, definition of health, so I won't repeat it here. And I would just say, uh, meanwhile, life goes on in this imperfect world, and medical treatments are the major contributions to cost. So what I will do here is attempt to describe a fair approach to medical priorities, namely what we should do for patients seeking medical health under conditions that exist today and in the foreseeable future. Is there an ethical and fiscally responsible way out of this mess? And Winston Churchill had the famous quote, Americans always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I say. US politicians and policy makers, and <clears throat> that includes some of you folks, have been preoccupied with how to pay for medical Hardly any thought has been given to what you need paid for. As though medical care is a commodity that needs no examination, or what medical outcomes should receive priority in a just society. Okay, so how do we do it? Okay, I think it, there might be a way out if the rationing plan is seen as consistent with our so-called political culture. And it also provides easily accessible appeals procedures to resolve disputes over implementation. I'm talking now about the practical focus. Also, if we focus on medical outcomes that should be achieved in a just society, and medicine, as you know, cannot serve every personal need, desire, and good. Everyone is not entitled to everything. Everyone is entitled to a decent minimum level of care. Decent minimum is a term we, we use a lot in medical ethics, a decent minimum. You hear the basic services of medical necessity. But a decent minimum says everybody should get a decent minimum. Now, what is a decent minimum? And here I ran into the problem. Zeke Emanuel says, philosophers have made a case for a decent minimum without specifying anything about the contents of the minimum. Norm Daniel says, the basic package of services according to politically determined lists. It is typical of such appeals to uh, list that there is no rationale offer for why items are on this list. So I'm going to give you a rationale. And I say in my paper that uh, uh, physicians rush in. Success of an individual depends on the success of a supporting society. The success of the society depends on the productivity and contributions of its individual members. And as Larry Churchill said, as a just health care system, 
requires them to recognize that we're all in this together. So here's what I propose. Instead of listing procedures, let's focus on medical outcomes. Let a decent minimum be those medical procedures that provide. And the categories that I have enunciated, I think most people say, oh yeah, that suits me. And I'm going to test it with you. A level of medical care that enables a person to acquire an education, would anybody object to that? Seek or hold a job, I add seek because of the unemployment problem, as long as he's working, he deserves it. Or raise a family. We are caring, we are taking care of children and each other. Or, and that's the, that's the kind of life-sustaining version that I'll amplify. If the person, because of impaired health, is unable to do this, people should be such to that allows the person to attain a reasonable level of function within the person's limits and respectful of the person's dignity, as well as a reasonable level of comfort, whether it be from pain or other forms of suffering. Now, limits of whatever we're talking about, the needs and desires of the people involved. We try to be reasonable. That's the best we can be. Okay, just to get the defense or to defend this, does not advocate a hierarchy of merit or wealth or social worth. Some people say, oh, you know, that the poor people and they are going to suffer. Rather, it respects the right of each individual to make one's own life's choices. One's education might be short or long, but might work with a shovel or a computer, with a paintbrush or a frying pan, on a construction site or in a taxi cab, as a farmer or a pharmacist. For patients gaining an education, seeking or holding a job, or raising a family, a decent minimum would guarantee, and I would emphasize it, would guarantee access to all necessary, and here's the Here's where it's essential. Resource limited. In the ethic literature, this is called comparative. In other words, if you get it, I can't get it because there's not enough to go around. So we're just talking about those treatments which are resource limited. Life sustaining intensive care and being high priority for organ transplants. Okay. This aggressive, again, I emphasize, resource limited, life sustaining version of decent living would not be designed, but would not be guaranteed if the person were not pursuing or meeting any of those goals. Instead, the person would be guaranteed a version of decent minimum based on the person's functional comfort, not capacity and comfort. Now, some of you are going to be saying, oh, so you're going to let these people die. Oh, you're going to treat them without caring the, the fact that they're not working. You're, you're going to give them miserable health care or whatever. Here's, here's something that we, that we don't know and what's so wrong with medical care today. We should not fall into the more is better trap, thinking that attempted CPR, long stays in the ICU, ventilator, feeding tube, toxic chemotherapy, Dialysis are always superior to comfort care at the end of life. In fact, quite the opposite. And I cite a paper with uh, patients with advanced lung cancer were given palliative care versus the standard aggressive life sustaining treatment efforts. The people who got palliative care felt better and lived longer. And this is something that we recognize that just because somebody's in the ICU and is in terminal cancer, and this is what we see a lot, they get these high costs, highly toxic chemotherapies to the very last day of life, manifestly ineffective, obviously, when they could be getting good palliative care, comfort care, insofar as that it's possible to allow them to live the life and experience the best part of life without just prolonging them in a, in a terminal condition. So this is, this is what, you know, I have to uh, defend too. 
Now, another bit of evidence is that what's happened is, and some of you probably know this, is that more and more people are leaving the ICU and are being transferred to acute long-term uh, long acute care facilities. This is an advantage to the ICUs, of course, because they can bring in newer patients and make more money and they don't have to worry about being limited by DRGs. But long-term acute care facilities have more leeway. And so it's an advantage to them. What is the problem is that the folks who are transferred have a worse mortality rate than the people who are transferred out of the ICU to anywhere else. So this idea that they are going to benefit by continuing this acute care in the long-term situation is not supported by the, uh, by the data. Okay. Here are some of the, uh, I, I, again, I'm, I'm sort of responding to some of the other comments. Uh, instead of band-aid, you know, one size fits all, and you've all heard this basic package of services. And by the way, health affairs uh, in this last issue shows what the Obama health care plan is proposing as its basic package, package of services. I don't know if you've seen that. It has several problems. One, it's just a bunch of services. Two, it's a bunch of categories of services. So they say it must include hospital care. Well, what kind of hospital care? It must include pediatric services. Well, what kind of pediatric services? So this is, what, this is what we're being given. And I'm suggesting that we should be tuning our medical outcomes to what are the needs of the person experiencing them. So, we recognize that workers who perform heavy physical labor, white collar workers, and people of varying mental abilities would have different treatment requirements. Uh, another thing that I would argue is all treatments should be based as much as possible on evidence-based medicine. That's the sort of thing that I think everyone agrees on that we should do better together. Okay, I'm gonna show you, here's what an example, diabetes mellitus. Uh, some of you know, it's a serious disease with complications in the heart, the cardiovascular system, neurology, the uh, kidneys. It's very common. Uh, and uh, let's just see how we can uh, deal with that. But when uh, we're talking about prenatal care, I say guaranteed access to care that gives the developing fetus and newborn the best chance for a healthy beginning and continuing in life. One of the things we learned, good prenatal care not only provides a healthier infant, but later in life, it turns out, good prenatal care is associated with a long-term benefit. When I say guaranteed, if necessary, it should be free. This is the opposite of what's happening in healthcare reform today. The economists are talking about, oh well, if we uh, increase the, uh, uh, the prepayment uh, 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 cost, or the, if we put any kind of financial obstacle in the way of people getting their primary care, then people will be more reluctant to go. That's good, that'll save money. But in fact, that's contrary to what you do good medical care. And it's also not ethically fair because if people can't afford it and they're pregnant, they should still be able to get it and we should be able to guarantee it. So that's, that's uh, in the beginning. Childhood to adulthood, here again, you notice I emphasize guaranteed access to appropriate screening and immunization along with nutritional and lifestyle counseling to reduce risk factors such as obesity, involvement of social services and legal aid if for people who are in community clinics or are having a hard time getting access to, uh, to just the thing they need the most like uh, transportation or protection, safety. This is where the law may be called upon to help. If necessary for those who encounter obstacles to access so once again, childhood guarantee, everyone gets this. If, they, if you want to make a small cost on this that is not going to be a burden, not going to be an obstacle, I don't have any problems with that. But there should never be an effort to limit people getting this kind of medical outcome. Adulthood, once again, guaranteed access, and here's where 
if despite all these wonderful things, a patient comes down with clinical diabetes, that person would have guaranteed access to, again, the term that the key is resource limited life sustaining treatment. Not all life sustaining treatments. We're not denying people life sustaining treatment. We're beginning to start prioritizing who gets the life sustaining treatment when only one out of two can get it or something like that. Who gets priority? And, and including ICU, renal dialysis, and high priority for organ transplantation. And if the person was seeking education or employment, working or raising a family, those would be the criteria. Now, this aggressive life sustaining version of Decent would not be denied, but resource limited treatments would not be guaranteed if the person were not pursuing any of these goals. This is rational. Instead, the person be guaranteed access to treatments that, remember what I said, to provide a reasonable level of function and comfort within the person's limits that are respectful of the person's dignity. So these persons would not be put on uh, endless dialysis if they were, say, permanently unconscious or get uh, attempted CPR if they were in the terminal phases of cancer, which is what we see today. Okay, just some data. And I'm going to do this quickly because I can't you folks in, and it's in the article, you'll see it better. How does it work when we talk? Here, here okay, I've talked about diabetes. Here is what happens when we did the rationing. Back in the 60s, uh, we developed the technology of renal dialysis. What happened at that point is there was very limited uh, availability, and they developed uh, a panel to choose who would get and who wouldn't. And people were outraged because you know, the, the, the selection panel were all white, middle-aged, mostly male. And naturally, the people who got the, the access to the dialysis were mostly white, middle-aged, male, and they thought this was not America. And so what happened in 1972, the end-stage real program was put in. And Congress just threw up his hand, OK, everybody gets it. No questions asked. Now, dialysis was first developed in England after the blitz, where people who suffered traumatic muscle damage would suddenly have their kidneys blockaded. And they figured out a way to dialyze them until the kidneys repaired. What happened in this country is that Building Scribner discovered how to put in a Navy shunt, which meant that you didn't have to be hospitalized with an IV put in place. You could get repeated dialysis for chronic kidney disease. Now, initially, as, as you see here and as you'll see in the article, the projected needs for this were, oh, yeah, it's tolerable. Uh, what's happened is that just about everybody gets it. And that's included people with multi-organ failure who had no prayer of ever surviving. People in permanent vegetative state were unconscious, have no way of appreciating what's happening. And so as a result, this is a very overused treatment. We have to figure out how to limit. Now, in the case of dialysis, the limitation will have to be put on money because that's what it is. I mean, we can make all the machines in the world, uh, but it costs money. On the other hand, organ transplants, which is the other uh, alternative treatment for uh, renal failure, the limit is organs. We don't have enough organs to go around. So one of my complaints is that although dialysis, everyone has covered, and I've already expressed why that has been a, a mess, uh, in transplantation, the priorities are based on blood type, antigen matching, well, that makes sense. Body size, that makes sense. Even urgency makes sense because you always, it's the so-called rule of rescue. And, and you've all seen it happen, you know, whereas we ignore poverty and poor kids and, and people who don't get dental care. On the other hand, if a little kid falls down, well, uh, everybody has to spend millions of dollars to rescue that kid. That's part of our emotional makeup. 
So you can make an argument that urgency matters, although outcomes should be paid attention to because sometimes the most urgent use, particularly in liver transplantation, does not have the best uh, outcome. But the one that I think is not an appropriate one is time on the list. These, these were chosen because the folks said they didn't want to make bad decisions. Okay. So here's what we end up with. Because of the way it is now planned, a retired 70 year old with no family responsibilities, diabetes, hypertension, waiting two years, gets a kidney ahead of otherwise healthy 45 year old parent and school teacher with aggressive glomerular arthritis waiting one year. I think that's reversed. Paradoxically, again, according to my criteria, Medicare patients with the fewest obligations and the most free time to enroll in more than one center have the greatest chance to secure organ transplant. I have to tell you, I'm speaking against interest here. I'm supposed to value my opinions even more. Okay? Okay, well, now we're getting onto some of the, the, the refinements. Uh, suppose someone wants more than the decent minimum is willing to pay for it. It's not medically futile. Should we permit it? Yes. Won't there be different levels of medical care if we allow this? Yes. Isn't this unethical? Not in the U.S., which, as I say, will always grant moral space for the affluent hypochondriac who demands a tranquilizing MRI. We just have to say, you know, this is America. Is it unethical? No. As long as everyone has a decent mood, we're willing to make, get more to the people who will pay more as long as they don't interfere with folks getting a decent minimum. Interestingly, in Canada, some of you know there was a Supreme Court decision when one physician sued the courts because one of his patients had to wait an eternally long time under the Canadian Medicare. By the way, our Medicare was named after their Medicare. And the Supreme Court made a ruling with shock in Canada, which up to then said nobody should get better than everyone else. It said, look, this is intolerable. This person is not getting good, reasonable medical care, so you can go outside the system. Well, people said, oh, oh this is a big deal. I mean, rich people are going to just take over and, and, and ruin everything else. What's happened in Canada, as I understand it, and by the way, I read it in a wonderful book called The Healing of America by T.R. Reed, is that the Canadian government, now spurred by what's happening, is improving its medical care by getting more doctors, getting better facilities, making sure that they do improve their uh, services. So my hope would be is that instead of it just being two tiers, and they fear that, okay, one tier will obliterate the other, that it might be a spur to the other. Okay, I'm going to go through some objections so that you have 15 minutes for talking. Okay, this is great. Okay, some people say consumer choice is the American way. Okay, I argue, okay, it's not limited. Oregon, how many know about the Oregon Health Care Plan? Okay, I would have thought more. I didn't want to have to explain that. Okay. <laughs> okay. In Oregon, uh, uh, Kitz Kitzmiller, who was an emergency physician, was governor, and he made, and there was a, there was a, I'm going to have to take a minute. Yeah, to, it's a hard plan to explain. Okay. But I, I can explain the, the theory, why I object, why I applause it. I think you should know a little bit more about it. A, a child with leukemia uh, needed a bone marrow transplant which they assume is going to cost maybe a million dollars or more. And it was a Medicaid uh, patient. And uh, uh, the Oregonian said, no, we can't afford that. You know, think of all the things we can do with all that money. It was a huge outrage. They just said, OK, we've got to do something about it. So they had a bunch of community meetings. And they established priorities. And the, and the good part was that people who had the time and said, I think everybody should get this. Oh, I don't think that's so important. And so they listed, and it took a bit of doing and, and nudging and all that, to get a list of priorities. And they said, we'll pay for everything as long as we have money. If you below that, sorry, we won't pay for it. And cosmetic surgery lost out, among other things. Okay. 
The only problem is, although this was the only time that a community actually uh, met together to ration health care, and they should be congratulated for that, they were just thinking of their wishes, what they would want, and did not think of what society needed. And I find that a flaw in that plan, and that's what consumer choice. Now, what's interesting is that consumer choice seems to be the American way, but in fact, it's not. Back when the, the, uh, the colonies were first coming together in a confederation, and it was a mess because they all insisted on having their own way. The founding fathers had finally wrote the Constitution, people like Madison, John Jay, Thomas Jefferson, and said, and Madison and, and Jay, and I think uh, Jefferson too, wrote the Federalist Papers, which justified what they were doing. They say, look, you've got to have a central authority called the United States of America. The states can have their own independent rights but here's the deal. Sometimes you get to do what you want, but there's a thing called the public good. Government has to provide not only for the public happiness, but for the public good. And I'm going to emphasize that I think that's where medical care uh, goes. Okay, healthcare reform. I group of folks uh, put together uh, focus groups and showed that people can reach a consensus. Now, this was a, a kind of laboratory experiment. As you see in the paper, uh, I say most uh, social behaviorists uh, say, you know, you can't be sure that you can translate to the wild setting what you do in the laboratory. And in fact, we had an example of that. I don't know how many of you remember, now it's two summers ago, the, 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 the sessions on healthcare reform and the wild setting and, and what a disaster that was. And there's a, there's, a, there's a philosophical objection in my mind. Consensus came out of the law and business, where you come together and say, let's see if we can agree to do something. Now, usually it's money and property, something that's easily divisible, something that you can compromise. So what you end up saying, is, doesn't work in medicine because there's some things that you cannot do, even though you agree to do them or shouldn't do. And so there's more to it. There has to be a focus that's good. Ethical consensus and decisions must be ethically defensive. As somebody pointed out in, in, in one of the critics of my article that the proposal is subject to abuse, and I point out that Ironically, what we're seeing today is already abused by uh, uh, special interest groups and regulated contributions, misleading political ads, bias, media, and lobby lobbies. In other words, the kind of openness without any goal, without any recognition of what is it we're trying to achieve? Is it justice or is it not? People lacking that kind of grounding are easily abused because they're told, oh, it's going to cost you money. You don't realize. Well, I'm getting something from you. Or somebody I might be in the gym that that person is in. So I should maybe be a little bit more compassionate. Uh, somebody pointed out that, oh, this will lead to the totalitarian state. And I'm sensitive to that. The idea that if the government is telling you to do something, and you, and remember I said, uh, you are expected to have an interdependence with the government. I can imagine how it could be that individual would be used as a, merely as a means to an end. That's Kant. I don't know how many of you know that Kant says that's not right. Each person is an end in himself or eats in himself. Okay, Tom Friedman said, you know, nonsense. Uh, this country has been threatened and indeed has been harmed by demagogues, but it's defied totalitarianism. I mean, we're just got too much free, free markets with the law of the human, et cetera. So I personally don't think that there's any evidence, and, and we've been tested during the Great Depression when communism was a, a big effort on some part of that we got to become communist. During the Nazi period, it was a very strong anti-immigrant uh, group of people. There are still those people, but our country doesn't fall for that stuff. 
must we call it rationing? Here's one of the most serious uh, criticisms. I have deliberately used the word rationing to kind of put it in your face. We cannot fool ourselves, as Ted Marmer says, we can't hide behind these, these niceties and euphemisms. It really is uh, rationing. Now, if some of you want to suggest a better word, and the only other word I thought that may work better is prioritization. But we still have to say, look, you can't have everything, you can have everything you want. And I then point to uh, Alfred Kahn, who was uh, one of President Carter's economic advisors in the 1970s, before you guys were born. He was told off uh, for scaring the public by warning that the American economy was on the verge of a deep recession. So in his next speech, he substituted the word banana <laughs> So I'm beginning to think, instead of saying rationing, you should just say banana, and then people will not feel bad. Uh, Dan Callahan, who I mentioned before, who uh, is the founder of the Patients Society, asked to see my proposal to send it to him. And, he's, and here's the gloomy resignation. He's a very experienced person in all this. He's written a lot on rationing. Your plan is very good, but what I find most discouraging is that bioethics has had no serious role in whatever in the health reform debate, supporting my long held observation that health policy experts and healthcare economists have no interest in ethics, maybe in justice once more, but not much. That's you folks. Um, okay, is there a better way? All right, what I say is if you can offer a proposal that does a better job, great. If it balances idealism and realism by compassion and practicality. The national theater is all around us. The hard-nosed, market-oriented U.S. crudely monetizes medical care, while more compassionate countries in Europe, for the most part, mainly struggle to maintain social welfare solvency. Sooner or later, we're all going to have to do something different and better than what we're doing now. And I bring us to the word solidarity. Uh, the American exceptionalists really object to that. And, and I, it's funny because I was giving a talk down in North Carolina, and uh, somebody heard my talk and all that. And it wasn't this talk, it was on medical ethics of some other sort. And uh, I had just come back from Berlin, where I heard the term solidarity. And I was so impressed by the attitude that we're all in this together. And I mentioned it to the table uh, that I was having dinner with. I said, you know, I hate the word solidarity. It's so important, so valuable. If I were to mention it, though, in this country, I would be accused of being a communist. The one of the persons you know, said, no, Larry, we don't think you're a communist. We think you're a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is the last slide. Where do we go from here? Can the voice of bioethics rise above the noise? We all heard the shouting and screaming out death battles. Can, just what I said, the ethical approach to, to rationing medical care that deals with this medically and socially responsible way? And I just, again, I'm afraid uh, <clears throat> to offer you folks, but when Clinton was elected president, one of the first things he did was he gathered together a bunch of economists, and it was a show that was put on television. Sure, you might yeah, I remember this. It was exciting television. I mean, these economists were laying into each other, and as we got to watch it, we got to understand the issues around the different approaches. It was very intellectually satisfying, and coincidentally or not, economy prospered under Clinton and went into positive budget balance because people knew what was at stake and what the issues were. Can Americans be persuaded to face the truth that a just society of rationing medical care is inevitable and necessary? Do the math. I just say, do the math. You can't get away without saying yes. Do the math. Can Americans be taught that our constitutional democracy involves more than permitting self-interested consumer choice? It also requires seeking the public good. That's hard, because that's a cultural thing. We really have to make the country see themselves in a different way, in a way that all the other advanced countries see themselves, and all in universal history, and can't believe that our country doesn't find that just fundamental. 
And then finally, the health of society is a public good. It also requires seeking a public good. And the health of society is a public good, not just something that's subject to market provision. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thanks very much. So we have time for some questions. So, uh, good. Go ahead. I saw that hand go up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, regarding the recipe, who should be the practice this recipe? Like, the, I mean, the first line is the provider, right? And then the insurance company or? Uh, okay, in my paper, I say it has to be universal health care. That's the same thing. So that, as all of you know, that to get the benefits of prevention, you have to have the benefits of the outcomes. So you have to start with something global in this country. And Ted Marmer says, there are mechanisms whereby you say, look, this far, but no further. This much, but no more. It has to be at a policy level. And you can have experiments with the states, you know, experimenting with that, but it has to be a government, a federal government commitment, in my opinion, and then set these standards. Mm -hmm. This is an ongoing problem. First of all, even to get it passed, I, I have no conditions, and my hope is that maybe in my lifetime we'll get to something like this. But uh, if we have a direction that everybody says, you know, that's fair. And if I don't get what I want, I have fair access to an appeals procedure. And if I can take any job I want or go to any school I want and please my family. And by the way, I say it's not an age-based rationing because in some extended families, grandparents raise their children. So the, the crucial thing is, are you responsible for the primary care of your family? And, and so all those things. Now, when when somebody says, oh, I want it, I even give an example of a rich guy who inherited money and, and, and travels around the world and, and, and uh, he needs a heart transplant. Uh, do his travels uh, count as education? The fact that he's single and he loves his distant aunt, uh, constitute a family, and, and, and he belongs. Does that constitute his job? Well, you know, we probably wouldn't think so. Don't forget, we fill out forms like the income tax form, and it says, what's your occupation? So if you say, oh, I'm a poet, and therefore I want to uh, discount half my house because that's where my poetry, that only work for a while until you get recognition. So there are mechanisms that support this kind of approach. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you seem to choose your words very carefully and I noticed that you say raise a family and not care, caregiving in general within families. So what about all individuals who care for elderly people um, and therefore reduce the cost? I'm glad you asked that question um, because that's what I put in the second level. And uh, as an example, uh, one of my critics said, oh, what about Down syndrome? You know, uh, those poor things, you know. And I, first of all, criticized them because that's the stereotype. Down syndrome children can be school without a job, you know. Uh, but if they require care, then this is what we fit in to help them with dignified lives with the assistance that they need. Right now, Medicare, as you I'm sure know, you, I mean, I have patients, you know, who uh, all they wanted was to be able to get a ride to the library, to the theater, to the concert, and Medicare wouldn't pay for any of that stuff, you know. On the other hand, if she needed a heart transplant, if she needed three heart transplants, she could get whatever, those things. Medicare has to be revised, and, and it would be under this rationale, see? And it wouldn't be that we're taking away something. Obviously, Medicare patients uh, or elderly people who say, oh, you're going to take away my chance to get a liver transplant. Well, you know what? You've had your fair innings. Your kids will have a better chance. 
they need it. I'm getting whatever they need if you forego them for the transplant. And that, that's where we're trying to get folks to understand, and that's what the concept of solidarity says. I think my, my, my question was not specific to that, oh. specifically to the individuals who are taking care of people who need the care within families. So adult children who are taking care of older yeah. parents, they can't work sometimes because they have to take care of older parents just like they need to take I care of. I explicitly so those say they should be reasonably reimbursed. You can see in that article, I see an interest in You have to do. But also in that, in some cases that uh, your standard will running against the law like uh, American Disability Act mm -hmm. and uh, since people has a disability yeah. will put a lower priority. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've already had a lawyer tell me you got a lot of legal troubles to get over mm -hmm. a lot of legal obstacles and it's true. But the U.S. Supreme Court, which did something in the United say all prisoners should get any, the best health care, then take into account its impact on society. And I think that's what we're going to have to start seeing. And there's one of reason. Remember, in the uh, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, there is make reasonable accommodation. So reasonable in the presence of cost limits, they need a different thing than what we're talking about reasonable that they say, oh yeah, I like this very much. We may have to do something and it will take some it will take legal um, efforts. Yeah. But <clears throat> do you see an age limit, let's say for uh, kidney transplants or heart transplants? Um, do I see it? Yeah. You know, Absolutely not. Okay. Is that possible that there won't be age discrimination? It's okay. This is something that, that yeah. I've already alluded to. Uh, Eighty percent of people who die are on Medicare. Okay, so clearly there is going to be uh, cost savings directed at that area. Um, right now, uh, Medicare patients have unlimited access. I'm telling them, as you saw in my slide, you don't go into the top of the list. You're not denied it, but here's somebody who's a breadwinner, a family person, and a high school teacher. With, uh, and he has acute glomerular lymphitis and had it for a year. Only a year. You've been on the list for five years because you have diabetes. I'm very sorry you have diabetes. But you don't do anything, you know. And the society needs productive people to enable you in the first place to get any medical treatment whatsoever. Now this is a hard lesson to, 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 uh, to deliver. One of the things about rationing, and it's different, another topic that I deal with is medical futility, where we're doing stuff that makes no sense because it doesn't benefit the patient. That's easy, although it's very controversial. Rationing by our definition is the denial of beneficial treatments, and that's hard. But on the other hand, it's, we're all in this together. And if you get it and somebody's child doesn't get it because you got it, I think a lot of people say, well, wait, you had your fair Now, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't be picking at you because you're obviously here to get education. You don't need to work hard and all that. But that's, that's the point that I'm making. We don't think in terms of the interdependence of the individual and society. That's an ethical argument. Okay. Um, I think your I think your argument's very interesting. I think mean, your proposal is very interesting coming from the perspective of someone who's younger and who's looking out. Um, but I have two questions, uh, points first and then questions to follow. Um, you seem to be making the assumption that the only um, productive activity that a person can have is to participate in a labor force, whereas being a productive member of society also requires you to be consumer of the economy. And so it has been a pretty you know, thorough argument for consumers of older ages being just as productive in the society as someone who has you know, 
employment and it's participating in the labor force aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so my question goes here are the two questions. One, being taking that in mind and with the you know longer lifespan of as you know as our lifespans are continuing, wouldn't you think that if older Americans are able to spend more in order to create a demand for goods that would then stimulate the economy to allow for jobs of younger people, that they would be considered as much of a high priority as younger people who are actually filling those jobs? Mm -hmm. And two, what would you think to the problem of limiting things to having a family for, say, people who might not be able to have children, who are actually not physically able to have children, and with the issues of adoption and not being able to create families, if you aren't able to have a child, does that preclude you from medical care? Okay, the, the second one, uh, I actually uh, was challenged about IVF. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you let, I mean, and the way it was phrased was pretty bad. Okay, so here are these women who work as lawyers until they're 40, 45 years old, <laughs> and now they want to get uh, pregnant, of course they can, and, and should we be, you know, and I, you know, I kind of said, you know, women are more than just uh, pregnancy uh, objects. And while she was working, she was productive, she was helping society, and her choice was to do this. And yeah, IVF, of course, because that would be a fundamental to this particular woman. This is an interesting question which I confess I have not thought of. And all folks consume, sort of teenagers consume. Um, in fact, should, they're actually a major driving force in the economy. Yeah, nowadays. should, now, here's, I'm, I'm talking now the top of the head, and, um, you guys can develop this argument just better than I. But you're distinguishing between the economy and society. In other words, spending money improves some people's income, no question about it. On the other hand, making things, educating, nurturing is a societal function that we all approve of. So I would argue that is different from simply spending money. That, that would be my argument. But to counter that, if I could, I don't know. Sorry if I yeah, no, and, and actually, uh, I think you folks will have to take this away as, as, as a good criticism. Yeah. Go well, ahead. my only my only counter to that, just very quickly, is that as wonderful as it is to make things, if there's no one there to buy them, then to make them is actually of no consequence. Yeah, but <clears throat> I have a feeling that. If you make things, you make money and you'll buy things. I mean, Henry Ford, you know, figured that out when he started producing his Model T. He realized, oh, I better pay my uh, workers, the workers who made this so they could buy it. So I have a feeling that simply saying, oh, old people buy things. Actually, a lot of advertisers would not agree with that. You know, they say, old people, you know, they're in Nobody wants television commercials to be aimed at old people, aimed at young people. So I, th I think we have time for one more yeah. final question. Monica, you'll get the last word. Okay. Um, I have a couple comments, and, and um, one of them on uh, Christine's question. Um, I've been working since I was 15. Uh, this summer, I'm planning to retire. I'm very excited. I've been productive and saved religiously my whole life so I could have a fun, um, prosperous uh, new chapter in my life. So this discussion is um, a little scary, but on the other hand, if I get sick, I've also worked very hard to remain healthy, if I get sick, um, my savings get passed on to the next generation of my family. So it won't be like that money will be unproductive. It, it survives me. No, this will be tax break. Mm -hmm. um, the, Good plan. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I've, I've worked hard and planned for a long Sorry. time. Um, the other comment is 
the perception of the word rationing. Rationing, I perceive as being a very rational exercise. And somehow, we need to get society to perceive it that way. As opposed to being afraid of rationing, recognize it as being a rational process for scarce resources. Well, good. And that's why the one term other than bananas, which I <laughs> <laughs> is prioritization. Yes. And I, I welcome, and I'm going to we'll let you go, uh, but I hope somebody will be interested, be interested enough to see if you get a grant, I'll help you. Uh, and you will be first author. I think we have to see that if you would do something like uh, analyze the costs if there are any cost savings and what it's all about. Is it all right if I pitch that? You, you just made a shameless pitch and I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, unlike a lot of people uh, who uh, uh, John Wilgermonder says, you know, that's just fantasy. They, they, they haven't justified their, their uh, uh, claims. I really feel obligated that everything I urge has to be grounded in empirical data. That's what I hope you folks will come up with. Larry, thank you very much. I just want to remind everybody that our next seminar, where's my paper here? I'll give it to me. Our next seminar is going to be on June 13th, and uh, the speaker will be Dr. John Du uh, from uh, Shanghai University School of Medicine, um, talking about, I've lost the title here. <laughs> can't find it. Oh, methadone uh, maintenance. So uh, June 13th is our next seminar. Thanks very much for coming today.